Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to church today, and if you're watching at home, you're very welcome as well. It's just lovely being with our church family, worshipping and praising God together. And we're going to sing a song now. It's a new one. We did sing it a couple of weeks ago. It's based on the words of Psalm 145, and we'll be singing this later on in the service. So have a listen and try and join in as you can whenever we're singing this. Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see you here in church and at home. If you're joining us online, you're very welcome. Uh, happy Mother's Day to everybody. Uh, first announcement is very important. Uh, please do listen to this. Uh, if during the service, especially towards the end, if anyone walks in late, having forgotten about the clocks, we do not stare at them and we certainly do not laugh at them. Uh, but it's good to have you here with us. Um, some announcements as always, mitigation still in place, masks when we're moving, and especially important still when we're singing, please, uh, the other mitigations you, you know. Uh, crash available, SML and pod on this morning. 
Uh, as always, lots of information in the e-bulletin. Uh, we've started producing a few paper copies of that. Uh, they'll be available in the vestibule. But if you get uh, the e-bulletin, can we ask you please do not lift one of the paper copies. They really are only for folk who don't have access to the internet or whatever, uh, but we'd love everyone to have that information. So the paper copies for them. Uh, tonight at 6.30, our Lent prayer meetings for Ukraine continue. Uh, Nigel and Tony Craig, missionaries to Hungary, who've just come back from a familiarization visit, uh, are going to share their experiences uh, on the Ukrainian border with us tonight. Uh, can I encourage us all uh, a month or so into the war uh, not to begin to, to lose interest in that, not to take our foot off the pedal, especially of prayer uh, and other support which we may be giving. And may I encourage everyone uh, to come uh, as part of that, to hear uh, a first-hand report of, of what things are like on the Ukrainian border with, with refugees and to join with us in, in praying into that. Uh, I think tonight we're going to have to meet in the, in the church for that prayer meeting. Uh, other rooms are in use. And speaking of prayer, our usual fortnightly gathering for prayer in the McFetridge Hall on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Uh, next Saturday morning, there's going to be an art exhibition by local artist Stephen Potts. Uh, proceeds from a voluntary admission fee donations will be split between Ukraine and Afghanistan appeals. Uh, many thanks to Stephen for lending us his, his art and to all involved in running that event. As you know, we are currently in the process of electing a new congregational committee. Uh, the voters list is available uh, on uh, copies here on the communion table and on the table in the vestibule. Please do check that your name is on that, if it should be. Uh, if it's there and shouldn't be, please let us know. Um, but as we think about committee, uh, we'll hear a little more in the service. But could we plead with you, please? that if you know you do not want to stand, if you know today that you wouldn't be able uh, to take up the offer of a post, could you let us know that and we'll mark the ballot paper simply not standing uh, rather than have people you know, sort of waste their votes and so on. If you do that, uh, it only applies to this election. Uh, it, it doesn't affect your eligibility at all for any future voting or committee posts or whatever. Uh, I think those are all the announcements. Our service next week, God willing, at 11 uh, is a communion service. So as we come to worship, would you bow with me in prayer? Father, that weather outside certainly lifts our hearts. But we want to pray for pure hearts and clean hands as we come today to worship, that there would be nothing in our lives that stops us sensing you here and responding to you. Our, our lives are full of so many things. Uh, our lives full of so many concerns. But will you give us quiet minds and humble spirits and so we pray, Holy Spirit, will you open our eyes that we could see Jesus. Holy Spirit, will you help us come closer to our great God, our loving Heavenly Father of great love. Amen. If we look at the screens, we'll see some words. We'll read these aloud together with me, please. Words which encourage us in our business today, which is worshiping God. And so we say, I will exalt you, my God, the King, I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. We're going to stand and sing that lovely version of Psalm 145 that Chris and the singers and musicians introduced. Lord God Almighty, we worship you. As we sing, I'll bless your name. Let's stand and sing to God's praise.
Let's continue to praise God as we pray together. Lord God Almighty, this morning we worship you, our great God, and we recognize that our thoughts, our words, our songs, our prayers are not sufficient to express your greatness. So we turn to the Bible, to your word, and just as we have sung Psalm 145, so we now pray it. We exalt you, our God, the, the King. We extol your name forever and ever, for you are so worthy of all our worship and more. You are worthy, our God, of infinite and eternal praise, for your greatness is without limit. And how we love to be together, reminding each other of this, rejoicing in this, and celebrating this together. And this morning, Almighty God, we think of the greatness of your love the love of our Father God for us, the love of the Lord Jesus for us, the love of the Holy Spirit for us. And we worship you, our great God of great love. We worship you, loving God, as we say that we need Jesus. We need your Spirit. We need your love so much. For we struggle in life and we sin in life. We confess this morning that we have not loved you this week with all our heart, souls, mind, strength. We each of us has gone our own way in what we have said and seen and thought, even felt. Forgive us, we pray, and help us to keep this greatest commandment, to love you who first loved us. And we confess too, loving God, that we have not loved other people as we love ourselves. We each of us has behaved and spoken and thought and felt in wrong ways about others. Forgive us, we pray, and help us keep the second greatest commandment to love others as we want to be loved. Father, some of us need to confess that we love ourselves too much, thinking too highly of ourselves. And others of us need to confess that we love ourselves too little, not believing, not accepting the truth and reality of your love for us. We're all a bit of a mess, Father God, but we rejoice in the salvation and cleansing and new start that is ours through Jesus. We marvel at the gift of your Spirit who lives within us to help us in life and through death. So Holy Spirit, help us today, we pray. Help us to worship our great God. Help us to receive the great love of our great God and help us to love our great God above all things. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to turn for our first reading to Psalm 86. And John McComb's going to come and read for us this psalm. It's a wonderful psalm which encourages us to, to turn to God, to worship him, and put our trust in him. Good morning, everyone. This is Psalm 86, a psalm, a prayer of David. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, 
For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvellous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. The arrogant are attacking me, O God. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, men without regard to you. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. John, thank you. Isn't that a wonderful psalm of such encouragement to us today? Now, boys and girls, uh, where are we? What's today? We've already said what day today is. What's the day? Mother's Day. Aren't mums amazing? Tell me this, how many people made their mum breakfast in bed today? A few hands going up. Uh, oh, some older hands going up as well. It's good. Was it a success? It was good, wasn't it? Yeah, a few nods through mums. Really, really good. Isn't it amazing on this day we can think about our mums and, and think about how much they love us and how much they do for us. Because we give them breakfast in bed one day a year, but I think maybe they give us breakfast every day of the year outside of that. They do so much for us. They love us so much. And what we're going to do in the service now is actually think about something slightly different. We know our mums love us, oh, say this much. But actually, Jesus loves us even more, even more than our mums. And God, our Father, loves us even more than our mums. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing uh, two beautiful praise songs that reminds us that, that Jesus loves us. The Bible tells us so and reminds us about God's love being deeper than the deepest ocean. So let's stand and praise God together.
Please be seated. So boys and girls, we were singing there about how much God loves us, how much Jesus loves us. And before that, we were talking about our, our mums and how much they love us. And I was thinking we'll pray now just before SML, but it might be good to, to say thank you for our mums. Would that be a good idea? Yeah. And I was thinking too that there are a lot of other women in our lives, maybe grandmas or aunts or sisters or girls who we know who are our friends that we could say thank you for as well. And in fact, when we think about things as a congregation, we are so blessed by the, by the women we have in this congregation, aren't we? Of all ages, from the youngest through to the oldest. So we want to say thank you to all our sisters in Christ for the way in which you love us all and serve us and help us. Uh, so our prayer is going to be for mums and every woman that you know, especially the love of Jesus and God your Father today. Let's pray. Lord God, today we thank you so much that we have this opportunity to say thank you uh, to all our sisters in the faith, to our mums and grands and aunts and the friends we have who are girls. Thank you for all the women and girls in this congregation who mean so much to us. And we pray today that they would know beyond any shadow of a doubt the incredibly deep love of their Father God for them. We lift our sisters in Christ before you and pray your blessing upon them. And as we do that, as we think, Father God, of this deep and wonderful love, we, we pray for all our boys and girls as they go out to SML that they would feel that love. And Lord Jesus, we thank you also that you love us and the Bible tells us that. And as our children and teens go out to SML and the pod, help them to know the love of Jesus in their lives, we pray. So Holy Spirit, even now, Will you let all of us here sense the love of God our Father, the love of Jesus our Lord? Let us know this love, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folk, time for SML and pod. And if I remember, coffee is in the hall today, so please do uh, stay and have a cup of coffee or whatever after the service. Before we go on to our prayers, uh, I'm going to ask uh, three or four people to come up and just take a few seconds each, a few moments each, and tell us about some really important things uh, that are coming up in the near future, things for which we're going to go on uh, to, to pray about. Um, uh, we're heading towards Easter. Uh, we've got a, an exciting Good Friday uh, of outreach coming up. Uh, we've got... Uh, Easter Explained, so Lauren is going to come and tell us about that, and David is going to come and tell us about Casual Cafe, that will be going on at the same time. Uh, they've been told they have no more than a minute, so get your clocks out, if they go more than a minute, shout. Good morning everyone, I'll have to see how fast I can talk. Um, yes, as Angus said, on Good Friday, uh, Easter Explained is happening again. Um, we're on from three to five uh, on Good Friday, and we're just going to have a great wee afternoon of games and crafts and all sorts of activities so we can learn um, about the Easter story. And this year, we really want to focus on the resurrection and the joy that that can bring us. Um, we are open to registering online if you want to 
Facebook on Eventbrite, um, but also if you would really like to help out, um, we would really appreciate it. Um, if you want to speak to me or to Christine um, or to Alison Huey, um, it would be great to have you along. I think that's less than 30 seconds. <laughs> hey, folk. So in line with our Easter Explained, we will have our casual cafe open. Um, this isn't a new initiative. It's been open before in line with various things. A great opportunity to bring maybe a friend, a neighbour, a work colleague along, simply to have a chat, to enjoy a coffee, um, to meet people within the church. It's a very casual, hence the name, informal setting, a great way to introduce folk um, to the church. I don't know how easy or difficult you find evangelism or discipleship. Well, this is kind of that very kind of basic level of getting alongside people, bringing people in, um, showing them a few folk around the church without maybe introducing them to a service or a Bible study or a course. Um, this is kind of the layer below, which is really, really important. So in line with Easter Egg Explained, three to five um, on Good Friday. Thank you. Just want to say the one minute limit doesn't apply to the minute, Minister. Um, so I know the children are out, but as a congregation, They'll, they'll obviously pick up all this information, but as a congregation, we, we really do want to pray uh, into the, these things and ask the Lord to be at work in them, uh, both in the lives of our children and, and other people who, who may be their parents and so on. Uh, as you know, we, we are talking a bit about committee at the minute, an election underway, and so Rosemary McNichol, uh, our congregational secretary, is going to come and speak to us uh, about the sort of people we're looking for. And Rodney, our treasurer, has a wee thing to say about finance. Why have a congregational committee? What is it? What does it do? Well, I'm going to be a good Presbyterian quote from the, quo the Code, which is the book of the Constitution and Government of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. The duties of the Congregational Committee shall be to take care of the poor and administer the temporal affairs of the congregation. And the Congregational Committee shall consist of members of the Kirk Session together with such members uh, elected by the congregation as the session may fix. Now, in 2022, this work consists of a vast range of business from the traditional finance and property to the newer demands technology brings. So we need people with many different skills and interests. We have a chairman, Angus, we have a secretary, a treasurer, and conveners of various subcommittees. All the committee members serve on these subcommittees, and the subcommittees at present are finance, property, audiovisual, catering, communications, the church news and the website, GDPR, all that data protection stuff, health and safety, IT, projects and welcome. We meet approximately eight times a year as a full committee and subcommittees meet in between as required and the sub some subcommittees have one person, that's easy. If you have any questions regarding the subcommittees, the work of committee, the duties or are interested in learning more, please speak to Angus, Richard, Rodney or myself and we'll try to help. We really need folk to step up to serving on committee. And we would remind all that the work of the committee members is not to do all the work of the congregation. Rather, it's to coordinate and facilitate the work. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. I knew when Rosemary started quoting from the code, she was going to take more than, more than a minute. So she's <laughs> taken part of my minutes. <clears throat> so just a, a quick update on finance. We, we finished our year uh, uh, and it was passed by session last week. Uh, just to go through very roughly at a high level the figures, uh, we had an income last year of four, just over 400,000, which uh, we're, we've always been an exceptionally generous church. Uh, so we had an income of 400,000. And even for the Ukraine appeal over the last few weeks, uh, we sent off a payment of 25,000 uh, on Friday, so that's, that's a marvellous uh, and very generous donation uh, that will be very useful over the, over the incoming weeks in, in Ukraine. Uh, just to cover the finance, uh, on our general account we had an income of just over 250,000, property 36, and mission 
uh, for World Development and United Appeal and some other local charities, we raised just over 107,000. So uh, that's where the 400,000 came from. Um, finance man always has some bad news. Uh, obviously, costs are gone up. And uh, as I say, happiness is earning 1,000 pounds and spending 900. Uh, we earned, uh, or the general account had 253,000 and we spent 258. So we had a, we had a slight uh, minus in our general account of 4,000 um, pounds. And just looking at, looking at this year, uh, we have increased costs of probably around 6,000 pounds. We have some increased running costs with power, light and heat, um, some wage increases. Um, and also last year we had a couple of uh, bequests and, uh, and a couple of, of one-off income. So uh, potentially this year we could be running at a deficit between 10 and 20,000. So it is something to, to remember um, throughout the year, but that's really a heads up. So thank you very much. Thanks to, to everyone for just sharing those prayer points. Um, we'll pray about those things and a few other things as well. Um, but could we ask you please to, to bear in mind uh, both Good Friday outreach and, and also the, the finances of the congregation uh, and the, the need to, to elect a new committee. Uh, it, it actually is a very important part of how we work. Uh, we don't often hear about the committee. We don't often see them, which is just a, a testament, I think, to how well they do their work behind the scenes. Uh, hours and hours and hours of effort that, that help us as a congregation. We're going to bring all of this to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Jehovah Jari Provider God, we thank you for your faithful provision for us in every aspect of our lives. And we thank you for how you have always provided for us here in this congregation. We pray our Father, that you would provide for us this year. We acknowledge before you, our God, the increases in the cost of living, it seems, across the world and certainly in our own country. We do want to pray for those in need. We pray for generosity of spirit, for governments and charities working to alleviate hardship. This morning, as, as we bow before you in this place, we thank you that you have given us so much, and we pray that you would help us to be good stewards of it, but also to make us generous givers. We pray that you would guide our giving to Storehouse, to the Ukrainian and Afghanistan appeals, as well as our ongoing giving to other missions and ministries. And Father, please help us hear and respond to you speaking about our regular giving to this congregation, that the work of Christ in this place would flourish. Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, we think of how the psalm speaks of making wars to cease across the world. We pray that there may be a ceasefire and negotiated settlement for Ukraine. How do we get our heads around that? How do we get our heads around so many millions of refugees. Lord Jesus, be merciful, we pray. And in sovereign grace, bring peace to that region. Enable people to return one day soon and rebuild not only their homes, but their lives. And will you bless your church in the midst of all the suffering and destruction and fear that she may be a place of safety and refuge and hope. Continue to move us, Lord Jesus, to give and to pray into that situation. Help us in that tonight when Nigel and Tony come to speak to us. Holy Spirit, you're the one who calls us to service, who gifts us for service. Will you please raise up for our new committee men and women committed to serving? Committed to serving as they use the gifts and expertise and experience you've given them. We pray for this aspect of our life together and ask that you would be very much at work overseeing the detail and overruling the results. And Holy Spirit, will you shape and direct our planning for Good Friday outreach? But more than that, will you come and work during those events? Will you draw children and parents to faith in Jesus 
as you open eyes to see Christ on the cross, but above all, risen from the tomb. So we commit our plans and our hopes for Good Friday outreach to you. Lord God, almighty God, three in one, one in three, in all that lies ahead of us, we pray, keep us close to you and faithful to your word as you work out your purposes for us, for this congregation, and for our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Diane is going to come and read for us our, our second reading, uh, John 19, uh, another of Jesus' last words from the cross. The reading is from John chapter 19, verses 16 to 27, and can be found on page 1088 of the Pew Bibles. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Amen. Thank you. Uh, as we think of that love of Jesus exemplified in that reading, which Diane did, uh, we're going to uh, approach the time of the, the sermon as we sing an older hymn. Uh, it's a beautiful hymn. O oh, love that wilt not let me go.
So our first sermon slide, um, let's me ask a question. Uh, I need a volunteer this morning, somebody who is prepared to let us strip you naked, put you on top of the communion table uh, so that you're fully on display, wobbly bits and all, and then the congregation is going to laugh at you and jeer at you and mock you. Anyone up for that? Nobody? It's exactly what Jesus did, isn't it? None of us want to do anything remotely like that. If we did, even in this place, let alone all the spiritual things going on with Jesus, we would be crushed, wouldn't we? The jeering, the mocking, the laughing. Do you see Jesus? Naked for all to see, because the soldiers are gambling for his clothes. Hanging naked, a couple of feet off the ground, for everyone to laugh at and jeer at. As Diane read for us, John 19, verses 23, 24, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, they divided them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. It was seamless woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one, other, one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And that's exactly what the soldiers did. Catless. A few feet away from the man they were torturing to death. They were gambling, joking for the equivalent of a pair of why fronts, I suppose, in, in our terms, or boxer shorts, or whatever. The money they could get for a piece of cloth more important to them than the life they were taking in such a horrendously cruel way. And Mary is there watching. Watching her son as naked as the day he was born 33 years before. And she sees the callous indifference of the soldiers she hears the venom and the laughter in the voice of the crowd taunting her son. What a topic for Mother's Day. And you can imagine, can't you? Every fiber in her being, in her body, wants to stop this living nightmare, wants to protect Jesus, wants to save her son, but she can do absolutely nothing except watch. Folks, can we enter into that in, in any way at all? Our next slide, uh, please, by, by tradition. Uh, some commentators say, as they, as they look into the culture of the time, by tradition, we're led to believe that that undergarment, uh, sewn by hand, top to bottom, uh, a gift from a Jewish mother to her son. And I wonder if, if that is so. If Jesus, through his agony and Okay, I imagine eyes half closed through the, through the beating. He's received the swelling, the caked blood that, that must be on his face. If he sees the, the soldiers handling that garment and if he thinks of his mum. And I wonder, I don't think it's too fanciful. I wonder if Mary, in the midst of this, oh, I don't even know how to describe it, the agony of all that's going on. I wonder if she suddenly feels her son's eyes upon her. And very low against all that background noise of hate and sin, hears that familiar voice speaking to her haltingly and softly, but with affection and love. Dear woman, here's your son. And then Christ's head swivels slightly as more blood from the thorns drip down over his face and onto his beard. And he locks eyes with his cousin John and his split lips move again. Here's your mother. And those phrases from Jesus on the cross form what we call the word of affection at which we're looking today. But folk, before we can hear those words, we need to see what is happening on the cross and around the cross because that is what Mary, that is what John are seeing then our next slide, our first main point, we're, we're looking at the, the power of love, the love of Jesus, uh, and the change in, in John. 
I, I suspect uh, that, that being at the cross that day was a, was a life-changing moment in John's life. He has suddenly been entrusted by this great responsibility by the Lord Jesus. He's asked to take on such an intimate and personal task for his dying cousin, his crucified Lord. And John's life was certainly changed by Jesus. And folk, today I want us to think about the, the power of Christ's love, the power of Christ's word of affection to change lives, because this is an example of his love in action. So let's look quickly at what John was like before coming to the cross. In Mark 3:17, uh, along with his brother James, they're called sons of thunder. So anger is obviously an issue for, for John, just as anger is an issue for a lot of us here in this congregation today, except when we're at church because we like to keep it hidden so that nobody looks at us. Is anger an issue in your life? If it is, listen to what is happening in John's life, there is such hope. Matthew 20, 21, uh, John, uh, well, they're, they're present when their mother Salome, that's Christ's aunt, we think, she asks Jesus to let the two boys sit at his right hand, his left hand in the kingdom. The ambition, the sheer naked ambition, lets them try to manipulate Jesus through family pressure in Mark's gospel. Uh, the emphasis there as it retells that incident is on their desire to get that for themselves. Arrogance is an issue there. How many people in this congregation are arrogant today? If you are, please listen, because there's such hope in the power of Christ's love to change us. But when we think of what happened with James and John and this request to sit at Christ's hand to be his number number two guys. It's interesting. Salome is refused by Jesus, as we know, and yet she is still one of the four ladies present and named at the cross, as Diane read for us. The, the love, the appeal of Jesus was such that even a rebuke didn't turn her away, didn't turn John away. He actually became the disciple beloved by the Lord. But at the start, anger, ambition, arrogance, characteristic of John's personality. So what about the anger, the naked ambition, the arrogance in your life? And yet something has happened, something has changed because John is the one to whom Jesus entrusts his mother. And in later years, after the cross and resurrection, we see the extent of how John is a changed man, as well as the gospel. He wrote down the book of Revelation. He wrote some letters in the Bible. What characterizes those letters? John 3.16, uh, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the whole world, the fallen world, even with the mess we make. God so loved the whole world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. First John, one of the letters, chapter 4, verse 8, tells us that God is love. Love marks the later writing of John. Love for God, love for one another. He's known as the disciple of love. Is this a man who has met and who has been changed by the power of the love of Jesus, his example of love and affection, even at the cross? See, John, although he was Jesus' cousin, more than that, he, he lived with, he ministered with, he followed Jesus closely for three years. He saw the love of God in Jesus in practical action in, in everyday conversation, each day, every day, and you cannot fool somebody for three years, can you? But I wonder if it might have been this incident at the cross that was so formative for John, persuading him that love is at the center of God's nature. It changed his life and it caused him to write those three words, God is love. And as we look at Jesus on the cross, as we hear our Lord speak these words of affection to his mom, folk, can anyone here today sit there and doubt the love of Jesus for you? 
See, John experienced this love in such a way as to be drawn to Christ and have his attitude, his behavior changed. And this is where I think this incident at the cross becomes so, so real and, and relevant and encouraging, I hope, maybe a wee bit challenging as well. You see, it's one thing to say, uh, I'm a Christian. It's another thing, though, to live it out in, in practice, isn't it, every day of the week. But the Bible does say it is by the fruit of our lives that we will be known. And I suspect, uh, as we're preaching this today, I suspect that, that a lot of the, the women here get this. But if we fear that some of the men don't, because you have this idea that love is a wishy-washy thing. You have this idea, oh, this is just touchy-feely nonsense. Is that what you're thinking, men? May I suggest to you that there is a power, a strength, an attractiveness to Christ's love, which causes us to do nothing other than respond with commitment to develop a strength of character, of courage, that actually will result in us standing up and risking, if not giving, our lives for something far greater than us. We see it every night in the news with men and women in Ukraine prepared to face the overwhelming might of Russia. If you've ever played sport, you'll know that if trouble breaks out in the pitch, you're there to help out your teammates. If you've ever served in the police or military, you'll know what it's like, your relationship with the, with the men, with the women around you and what you will do for them. If you've ever seen Black Hawk Down, a film about American forces in Somalia, it's a scene at the end where one of the characters, uh, after having an awful 24 hours in, in Mogadishu, he's about to go back out uh, to look for wounded American troops. And uh, people ask him, why on earth is he doing it? Why does he not leave it to some fresher troops? And he says, people don't understand. It is all about the man next to you. That's all it is. But folk, when that man next to you is Jesus, what sort of response does that elicit from us? What sort of response does that draw from us? It's commitment to the, his fellow soldiers that took that American soldier back out into action. It enabled him to go back to the sound of the guns when the rest of us would have been running away. And we call that heroism today. John abandoned Jesus after Gethsemane but of all the disciples, he's the only one, only male disciple to be named at the foot of the cross. Man, can I suggest to you that Christianity is exactly what John shows it it is, exactly what that American soldier tells us it is. It is all about Jesus. It is all about a strong and a passionate and a courageous love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about being prepared to follow him come hell or high water. It is about being prepared to give our lives living for him. That is the thing that is greater than us to which we are called. And we're called to lead family in that way of living, even as we push deeper and further into it ourselves. That is what following Jesus is all about, drawn by love. Isn't this what we see in John's life? And there is such a change because of that in John's life. Christianity, I think, is the only world religion that claims a supernatural change in its followers, the followers of Jesus. But do we see that in our lives? I've had more than a few conversations about spiritual things with non-believers who've been very firm in their assertion that they are turned off Jesus because of the the awful way in which they're treated by men and women who profess to follow Christ. Hypocrisy they see in church activities. Hypocrisy they see in business dealing with Christians. So do we have lives that prove the reality and depth of our experience of Jesus? Can I ask you this question? And bear in mind, I'm asking myself, there are three fingers pointing back. Are you a religious hypocrite? are you? You say one thing with your lips. You live a different way in your lives. Your social media pages show that. And your heart, oh, we're not even going close to your heart. We're certainly not going close to mine this morning. But John is living proof 
of somebody who has encountered the love of Jesus, who has seen it and heard it and is faced with it at this moment in time at the foot of the cross, and he is changed by it. Have we been changed by that love? Our next slide, the, the promise of love to Mary, the Lord Jesus and his care for his, his mum. If Jesus changed John's life, he, he cared for Mary's life. Folk, I don't know, how many times have you been out gardening and jagged your, your finger on a thorn or doing some carpentry and, and got a splinter and it's like nearly air ambulance to get us to A&E and we think it hurts. Do we have any idea of the physical suffering of the Lord Jesus on the cross? And you know when you're not feeling well or when you're in pain, the last thing you want to do is think about others. And here is Jesus. Oh, look, look, look at what he does. In his last couple of hours of life in agony, he thinks of his mum and of her future provision. Exodus 20 and verse 12, the commandment, honour your father and your mother. That has never been cancelled or rescinded. And here's Jesus giving us living proof of how it works out. It's what he's doing here. And it's an example of how we need to fulfill God's commandment to provide for our parents, even through third parties, if necessary. But at a deeper level, at a level which speaks so relevantly to our faith, is this truth that we see displayed here. God has always had Mary in his control and well-being. He has always provided for Mary, even in the oh, unbelievably difficult position of being mother to Jesus Christ. I think back with me to eight days after uh, the, the birth of Jesus. Mary goes into the temple court. Simeon meets her. He gives that very difficult prophecy. Mary, one day a sword is going to pierce your own heart too. And on this day at the foot of the cross, that sword is piercing her heart. But just as the Lord Jesus, or just as God rather, provided uh, Anna to come alongside Mary in the courts of the temple, just as Jesus uh, has provided John for Mary now, so we see how the care of the Lord is to provide for his people as well. Jehovah Jireh, one of the Old Testament names for God, God who provides. Folk, our faith is in such a God who provides for us what we need every single day of our lives. And although there will be times where we're under great pressure in education or finance or career where relationships break down or go through difficulties where there's bereavement or physical or mental illness or hardship or persecution and finally death. That's the way of the fallen world. But the promise of God is to provide for us and bring us through. Is that your faith today? See, our God is God who's with us even in the most trying of circumstances. Think how Mary must have been feeling. Can you go back there? I mean, many mums here in the congregation think about how Mary must have been feeling. And then her reaction when she hears that word of affection, that word of love from Jesus. It speaks not just to her ears, but surely to her heart. Dear woman, here is your son. She has not been forgotten by the Lord Jesus. He's still providing for her in such an intimate and personal way. And folks, is that not another wonderful example of the power of Christ's love and affection to change lives and situations? God looks after his own. And even in tragedy and despair, he is there. And he sees and he knows and he provides. That is our God. And look at how Jesus wants Mary cared for. He wants John to take her home. You know, no national insurance contributions have been paid. There's no pension for Mary. John, t take my mum home. Look after her. And that is exactly what he does. With folk, that idea of, of home going, is that not the whole point of Jesus on the cross so that one day we can all go home to be with him? John 14 Many rooms in my father's house, if it weren't so, I'd have told you. I'm coming back. I'll take you to be with me that you may be where I am. Folk, this, this wonderful word of affection 
providing strength to Mary, comfort to her, providing a home for her. Jesus still speaks exactly the same to us, helping us through life and pointing us to a homecoming that still awaits us. Then our final point, more quickly, our next slide. Dear woman, uh, this is your son. It points us to the care of Jesus for Mary, for us. But I wonder if we can read this in a slightly different way. I wonder if it's like somebody on top of that communion table, uh, only it's a cross that Jesus is on. And Jesus is saying, ma'am, this is your son. This is me. But this is what it has all been about. This is the whole purpose of my life, the whole purpose of my ministry, to be here at this moment in time, even nailed to this cross, and you are seeing it, and it is the fulfillment of what God has planned, and you have been so faithful in helping this come about. Do not be discouraged, ma'am. This is what it has been about, and it's because our Heavenly Father loves the whole world, and it's for the salvation of the nations. This is what... It has been about, and he's affirming to Mary that his horrendous death is actually part of God's plan. And he is, even at the end, encouraging faith within Mary. Is that not deeply significant for us folk? Do you think if Almighty God knew of any other way in which to save us, he would still send Jesus to the cross Are we still so blind to think that we can contribute something to our own salvation? Do we still think that we'll get to heaven without responding to Jesus? Do we think we can be good enough? Do you think you can walk out of here today without accepting the love of Jesus in your life by faith and committing yourself to him? I tell you the truth, said Jesus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Ephesians 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not by works so that nobody can boast. We are moved by Jesus' love for his mother, aren't we? But we also see the love of God for the world. Jesus knew the cross was the only way to save us. It was always God's plan. Folk, I don't know who I'm speaking to here or at home, but if you let yourself ask for and receive the love of God through Jesus, your sins forgiven, a new life. Have you done that yet? Because this could be the day of your salvation. And it's just a simple prayer. As we finish then, our, our last slide, a great challenge here. That, oh, I hope there's great encouragement as well. Because when Jesus was speaking his word of affection to Mary, to John, I do believe he speaks it to us here. And here's a a wee thought for you. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you're sitting here in this church today or listening to this at home because you've chosen to be. Don't make the mistake that you're sitting here thinking you've come back to church just because COVID mitigations have been relaxed. You are here today. You are hearing this today because it is God's sovereign will that you hear about his love for you. It is his loving will that you see Jesus on the cross in your place for you. So what might Jesus be saying? You know, I'll use my name, put your name in. Father, here's your son, Angus. Accept him because of what I did in the cross for him. And could it also be Angus, here's your heavenly father. Come to him through what I've done on the cross for you. So I want to finish just three simple questions. Folk, if you haven't yet, accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, will you let yourself come to the foot of the cross today, drawn by the love of Jesus for you, and accept him as Savior and as Lord? Or maybe you're struggling in life and faith, so will you come to the foot of the cross this morning and let the Lord Jesus pour out upon you his love, which we've seen in how he treated Mary and John, and provide for you in your need? And maybe you're going strongly in the faith, but will you come still to the cross this morning and let the Lord Jesus change your life even more by his loving power so that when you leave this place this morning, over these next days and weeks and years, you will be living for him 
in an even more different way that is closer to him and more like him? Well, which of those questions is for you? And how are you going to respond? Let's pray together. Father, we are your children through faith in Christ. We come to you through the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus who gave his life for us on the cross, but who rose from the dead, who still speaks his words of affection and love to our hearts. Holy Spirit, will you help us all turn to him wherever we are in life? Let us go home hand in hand with him, never to be the same again, for we are people who've been to the cross and met Christ and experienced his unending love. We ask it in his name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our final hymn, O oh, to see the dawn, the power of the cross.
Folk, I want to finish with just a few verses of the Bible, which I would love you to read with me. Uh, our next slide lets me ask a question. It's in the Bible. Forgiven at the cross, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then the answer comes on the next screens. Perhaps we could read these aloud together. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's say the grace together. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.